right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and uh, welcome to the live community gathering. Um, when we do the community, wider community gatherings, we generally meet at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So uh, for all those who are joining us live today, and there is quite a few of you, um, welcome. And it's wonderful to be here with uh, with the community uh, again as we continue to go through this message uh, from Sukkot, Michael. So we've been uh, we've been journeying on uh, on sharing what we had shared at Sukkot, although we were saying that the message is not just for uh, Sukkot. This is one of those messages in and out of season. Yeah, it's an apt message that it really doesn't matter what time of year it is. And also, more importantly, it's a message that no matter where you're at in your faith journey, you will draw something from this mm -hmm. uh, no matter where you are. Yeah, I think there's times when we just have to have our focus in in a certain place and in the right area and have it on him. And especially when the world is uh, uh, going a little mad around us um, and all the challenges and life circumstances, I think sometimes we just need to really revisit uh, why this is uh, what this is really all about. Um, and also to the prophetic nature uh, of these things uh, and how they relate to his appointed time. So. Uh, we'll do that. For those uh, who are just joining us via video, um, but you might want to join us live, then just go to riverschabbat.com uh, or to the Olive Branch. And when you do that, there's a way for you to sign up to the newsletters and to join us in the live gatherings. Um, and so uh, you just go to uh, the website there. And if you scroll down, you're going to see Welcome to the River. Hit subscribe. And uh, that'll take you to this little screen here. You just put in a first and last name and email address, and that'll get you on the community uh, newsletter list. And that contains the link to the upcoming live gathering. And that'll come out to you once a week uh, before the live gathering. So you can click on that and join us live via Zoom. Uh, if you've never joined us live, we'd love to see you. Come join us and uh, and come and meet the, uh, the wider community. Um, it is a wonderful community indeed. And so we'd be honored to have you. Okay, Michael, part two, message from the bridegroom, a time such as this, joy in him. What has all of this got to do with the appointed times and Bible? See, <laughs> As I said last week, and this may sound like a bold statement, but the topic of joy is intrinsic to the plan of redemption. It's interwoven throughout it, and it ties into the Moedim, even to the Bride of Messiah. It's uh, it's actually a topic that Curtis and I struggled to not go on many different rabbit trails uh, and to try and stick to the message. Um, and, you know, last week, we kind of gave the introductory kind of part, like now we're getting to really start the journey properly, so to speak, and actually look at joy and the various components of joy um, that we're going to encounter as we go through this series. Yeah. And what, and, and what does this really mean? You know, what, you know, we see this English joy and we see this throughout scripture, joy, rejoicing, rejoice, and how it's uh, sort of sprinkled throughout the scripture in both the, uh, you know, the Torah, the Tanakh, the New Testament, the, the Brit Hadashah, right throughout this thing we call the Bible. And one of the things that we don't tend to get, like a lot of things, we've got the challenge of our modern English. And this is one of those uh, words and terms and things that is used throughout scripture that it's quite interesting when you start to drill down as to what's actually being said uh, versus what might be in our mind, in our modern mindset, eh? our Western modern mindset, and we think of this word joy. And so what we wanted uh, to do is to start to look at this and go, no, the the even though it may be translated joy uh, in the English, in, in rejoicing and uh, rejoice and things like that in scripture, what it's conveying actually has some really deeper meanings and understanding um, in context to how it's being conveyed at various parts of the scripture. Um, would that be fair, Michael? Yeah, and as most of you will have probably noticed in this 
when, when we study the scriptures, you usually get the English striking again, you get culture striking again, you get leaven striking again, you know, and we have these preconceived ideas and notions and we, we assume that we know what something means. And it's not until we actually really drill down that we go, actually, you know, either I was way off or I was um, not fully informed is usually the case. Yeah. It's a funny thing because I say to people, well, this is one of the more prophetic messages that we've actually given um, in, in, in over the years. And people are like, you know, they scratch their head. How does joy relate? You know, <laughs> and it's one of those things where you don't, uh, because we're looking for, you know, um, you know, uh, scary, you know, anti-messiahs and, you know, things going wrong in the world or whatever else it is. And um, and yet the greatest prophetic message there is uh, and and how it relates to the plan of redemption is actually all centered around Messiah and the bridegroom. And so this is a very, very prophetic uh, message in the take. And we delivered this at Sukkot this year uh, live, um, the series. And so there'll be many people here that are gathered here that were there with us live. Um, and uh, and yet, uh, when you look at these things and revisit these things, I've had a number of feedback um, this past week of just how even though they were there, when then we gave the message, Michael, that they actually got a chance to revisit it and actually consider the message even again and how it's had even a, a deeper and greater meaning for them. Uh, and so that's been interesting to receive as well. Well, one of Messiah's key ways of operating is through repetition. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's... Uh, Let's get into this part two here. Um, and we've got it under join him. Um, we're in a, go back to part one of this series uh, where we just reiterate the whole relationship to actually the appointed uh, times of the fall Moedim, and in particular, the Moed of Sukkot and the week of Sukkot. Um, and we talk about that more in part one and just kind of give it a, a basis here. But one of the things that uh, I'll reiterate again uh, here, and we've got Matthew 15, 3, we've got Messiah speaking to some people here, Michael. And uh, <laughs> the king's got, he's hes reminding them of something. Yeah, so he, th he's speaking this to the religious authorities, the Pharisees and scribes, and he answered them, why do you break the commandment of Elohim for the sake of your tradition? And the angle we were taking on this in part one is, you know, not that, tradition in of itself is bad or evil but when well certain traditions there are some that go clearly against the word but those that kind of seem to fall in this gray area uh, especially as we try to express our um you know obedience to his covenant you know some people may keep shabbat differently for example but they're still trying to honor the shabbat as best as they know how when you get these various expressions but the problem becomes when you say it's my way or the highway. My way of keeping Shabbat or the feasts is the way over yours. And, you know, you sure would. Uh, he, he's really quoting Isaiah 29 here. And the warning he's giving is like, you know, through our traditions, can we actually become blind to the scriptures? And considering that the appointed times are all about messiah and the plan of redemption if we start to supersede his plan of redemption with our traditions are we robbing ourselves not only of a deeper understanding but ultimately even of a bridal journey of truly knowing our messiah at that deep intimate level yeah and so this is the risk that we have at the time when Yeshua was speaking to, there are many factions in the Sanhedrin, in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, many factions, but all were going to face the judgment. The temple was going to come down and all were going to be scattered. And so it didn't matter what faction you were within the religious establishment at the time, all were going to face judgment. 
And so some of the reasons for that judgment relate to these very types of passages. They had taken the traditions and had elevated them to the level of Torah or even beyond. And so I've got here, you know, for us to consider, have our traditions replaced the commands and do they truly honor Messiah and that he has come and, um, and the why of this all. And so this is just something for us to consider, not that we don't have traditions. We all do. In fact, indeed, when we met at Sukkot, we have certain traditions we do at Sukkot, which might express themselves slightly different than other people's meetings at Sukkot and, and uh, some of the traditions or the way they express honoring the Torah slightly different. Um, and indeed, modern Judaism has its expressions in, in many forms um, uh, as well. And so we've just got to be careful, though, that our expressions of honoring the appointed times uh, don't turn into, well, this is Torah. Um, is Sukkot uh, has many different um, looks and feels when it's being honored by the body throughout the world every year. And all of them uh, are honoring the Torah uh, in the sense of the celebration and being there and coming together as a body. But not all of them will look the same. The singing can be a little different. The dancing can be a little bit different. Some of the visual expressions and things like this. And we meet, we have to be careful that we don't get into a position because Again, Messiah is speaking to a religious establishment that understood the Torah better than anybody on earth today. And this is the warning to those factions of the Sanhedrin, all of those factions, and all of those factions were going to receive judgment. And so we have to be very, very careful what kind of division we bring into the body and what kind of self-righteousness and what sort of position that we take on certain matters to the point where it can actually separate brethren from having fellowship as a result of our traditions. And what, you sh what Messiah is truly addressing here is, is this is going to bring division. This, these traditions are going to get to the point where it's going to bring division. It's going to do these sorts of things. And so we need to be very, very careful of this um, because a religious system that understood the Torah better than anybody on earth today was essentially judged. And this temple was torn down and uh, and the whole system, uh, basically Yeshua put a bomb in it. <laughs> and, and, and this is where we have to be, we, there's no way around this. We have to take these things seriously. So as we seek to honor uh, and we do things like honoring the spring and uh, and the fall Moedim, we have to um, take these words seriously because this is not an opinion. This is Messiah speaking. This is the king. This is the creator. This is not a joke and we should not take it lightly. This is the highest authority that there is in the universe. I hope that sinks in. And when I read this, it sinks into me. This is not just a teaching by Michael and Curtis. We are reading the words coming from the highest authority that will ever be, that ever is, and that exists. And this is something now for us not to be flippant with. And so what we try not to be concerning the teachings and the precepts and men, and that includes our community. And so we are to be, uh, we are to be um, respectful of, of, uh, of the master and his words. Now at this time to do anything less is disrespectful. And so well, we, ultimately when traditions go rogue it, you end up doing violence to his torah to his people and to his appointed times so now that you know yeshua says be careful with your traditions well what are we then to look at curses eh? what what has messiah given us that he says i want you to look at this yeah. And that and that is given to us in the Torah. We don't get to reinvent it. And uh, what we did at uh, Sukkot, and I do this every year, we do accounting of the uh, Moedim <laughs> directly out of the Torah in Leviticus uh, 23. And I may, we, we may, we, we literally read it out and made everybody count what was considered a set apart gathering. And the reason for that is so that we don't argue these matters. There is one weekly and there are seven annual. It is very clear what it is in Torah. We don't need to reinvent this. We don't need to add or to take away from it. We just need to understand it. And then when we understand it in those lens, when we understand the Moedim, 
the way that he has delivered it and that it all points to the great plan of redemption, suddenly Bible prophecy becomes a lot clearer and a lot more simple and a lot more understandable when we don't try to take our traditions and precepts and teachings and religious dogma and everything else and then try to apply it to, you know, interesting statements in scripture, especially prophetically. And then we come up with, you know, I, you, you almost, uh, you, you're dancing, you're doing this prophetic dance now these days. And there's so much noise happening in people's heads that we don't see the clarity that Torah brings to biblical prophecy. And indeed it does absolute clarity, and it will start to um, bring real assurance and understanding. And with that, um, all throughout that is this thing of joy is mentioned in all of it. In the actual, uh, in 2 Timothy 4, 1, 2, um, I just want to reiterate this. It says, I charge you in the presence of Elohim and of Yeshua Messiah, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing, appearing and his kingdom. Now, you may not know, again, we read this even just in the English, what is the antecedent of what's going to follow here is what I just read to you. What comes before this and what's defining this is that Paul is speaking in very uh, appointed time language. Now, again, if we weren't taught this in our Christian upbringings and our religious upbringings on either side of the river, we won't know what we're actually seeing here. He establishes this in the sense of the fall Appointed times, the judge, the living and the dead. Welcome to Yom Teruah. The dead and the Messiah will be raised and and uh, those who are alive will be caught up to be with him. Then you will appear before the judgment seat of Messiah. Then he goes right on to young Kippurim, his appearing. And then he goes right on to his kingdom with Sukkot and the last great day. And he sums it up all literally in order, in sequence, before he says what he's about to say. Preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. The actual context here is the appointed times. And he's just spelt out the actual order of the fulfillment of the fall Moedim. They are speaking a language and a culture that they have lived their whole lives. And we don't know this in a modern Western sense when we're reading the word, just how they are speaking to one another. And he says here, Michael, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Hopefully that's what we're doing today with this series. Um, but, you know, what's going on here? Because if we actually look at what, what's happening here, a lot of people generally in a modern Western English sense would never be understanding that he's completely and utterly speaking fall Moedim language. And he is saying, be ready. When it's actually going to be coming about, and uh, and I've got here a footnote here on Galatians four one to seven, where he was addressing it the exact same way when it came to the actual fulfillment that had just occurred of the spring Moedim. He knew it had been literally completed in the great plan of redemption, and he spoke to it. The actual Greek there is using prothiasim, uh, uh my, and it literally is referring to the appointed times beforehand, prearranged. And of course, the Hebrew equivalent is Moedim, uh, sorry, Moed, appointed time, sacred season, or what sometimes we say feast, in the English appointed season. But what we are actually seeing, the best way that the Greek is capturing this, um, uh, and in the English, it's saying season. But when we say season in a Western sense, what does that mean, Michael? You know, immediately what will come to mind is when we see season in English? Well, Paul's not... What Paul isn't saying is be ready in spring, summer, winter, autumn. You know, he's not speaking in that way. He's speaking appointed times language. Um, you know, or you get the more Christian understanding, oh, this is a season of, right? A season of repentance or a season of great pouring out. Like th this is modern re religious talk. Like, and this is not, we, we can't superimpose our ideas onto the text. You know, Paul is, again, the context of season and out of season is when Messiah judges the living and the dead, his appearance and the establishment of his kingdom. Well, that's the fulfillment of the fall appointed times. Paul is literally saying, be ready at the appointed times and also out of the appointed times. And right now we're in this time period where we... The spring Moedim was fulfilled almost 2,000 years ago, and now we're awaiting the fulfillment of the fall Moedim. And we're in this season in between prophetically, coming to the end of 
you know, between Shavuot and Yom Teruah, prophetically speaking. Yeah. And, you know, the Greeks trying to capture it the best they can. T- please t- t- remember, everyone, that these words would have been originally written in Hebrew. Um, the Greeks trying to capture as best they can with the Akaros and uh, Akaros and Karos here. And it's trying to give, well, this is a fixed time. It's a, it, you know, it's not just, you know, um, this four seasons. There are many parts of the world that don't even experience four seasons <laughs> in the sense of how we've been taught in a, in a, uh, um, in a modern Western sense. Um, but the issue here is context. And the context is that he's delivering it in is in a Moedim context. And he's just laid out that the fulfillment of the fall Moedim are going to happen just like the spring uh, uh, Moedim have been fulfilled now. And he speaks about that in, in Galatians. And it's very important that just because we don't look at uh, the plan of redemption, the coming of Messiah's first coming and a second coming, we have not been raised to understand this in the framework of what was given to us in the Torah in Leviticus 23 doesn't mean that they didn't. There was no New Testament at the time this was written. They literally had the Torah and the prophets. That was their word. And they were raised and lived a culture where everything was based around Leviticus 23. This is how they spoke to each other, why they spoke to each other. We don't take some modern perspective in English and then suddenly, you know, make it whatever we want. The challenge here is to understand not how we want it to read, but how they we're meaning it. And this is the going back to the context of everything we're reading. And you'll start to see this more and more, even in the English. And again, we just got the English example up there. If you know that this is a Moedim framework, you know, he just laid it out. He laid out the literal fulfillment of the fall Moedim. And now he says, now that I've told you that, be ready in that Moedim and out of that Moedim to rebuke, reprove and exhort. And so we are, and we are commanded in the Torah when it comes to uh, when we are in an, uh, the actual Moedim, whether we're honoring them or we're dress rehearsing them, we are told to proclaim them. And so again, he's backing up the Torah here. But he's saying, proclaim them in them like the Torah is saying, but I need you to keep proclaiming this whole plan of redemption. And so it's a very interesting thing that he's saying. So, um, again, as we grow and as we learn the faith, we will start to be able to read things like the Brit Hadashah in its proper context. Um, because bearing in mind, they didn't have the book of Second Timothy when this was stated <laughs> in the sense of, you know, printed copies and they ran around and all had their New Testaments. Um, and so we just got to be very, very careful that we don't bring all our Western almost 2000 years later context and cultural mindsets uh, and then try and apply that when we're actually reading the word. And then we went into the parable of the weeping bride, Michael. And we talked about this time. Well, then if if we're actually looking out the window and seeing the full moon, guess what hasn't been fulfilled? Well, we're yet to see the resurrection occur. And, you know, a bride that is truly waiting for her groom and yearning for his return. And Yom Teruah comes and it goes, you know, and then comes the Feast of Sukkot where we're commanded to rejoice you know, how is a weeping bride, knowing that her groom is tarried yet another year, how is she meant to find joy in at the appointed time of Sukkot? Is the creator being, um, is he playing a joke on her? And is he asking something of her that's uh, impossible to do? So it's, it's a distressing time because if you're looking out the window yet another year and seeing that full moon during the fall appointed times, then we're still in a dress rehearsal and it's not been fulfilled. In other words, the bridegroom has not come. And so we are commanded, though, however, in the Torah, Leviticus 39, 40 here, it says on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land and around the harvest times it's a harvest feast as both are you shall celebrate the moed or the feast yeah of yah seven days and on the first day shall be a solemn rest a holy convocation or a high sabbath as we'd say today and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest it's which is another 
high Sabbath, the end of this, representing the last great day. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees, the branches, the palm trees, the boughs, the leafy trees, the, of the willows and of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yah, your Elohim, seven days. Well, I'm a weeping bride. Bridegroom's not come, Michael. And it's telling me that I'm supposed to rejoice. Um, so what's going on here as a dress rehearsal? What's happening here? And hopefully here, this is starting to give evidence that the biblical concept of joy and rejoicing is not a pursuit of happiness, as has been taught to us by a modern Western world. When we think joy, we automatically go to being happy. Now, if joy is linked to the pursuit of happiness, well, then you're going to really struggle to honor the Torah you know, come Sukkot when the bridegroom has tarried yet again another year. And again, is the creator playing a joke? Is he asking something of us that is impossible? Or have we misunderstood a concept such as joy that is actually interwoven throughout scripture? And if we've got the wrong concept of joy, and it is interwoven throughout the scripture and the plan of redemption, are we even misunderstanding a huge aspect of the plan of redemption and of a covenant between a bride and a group. And it's interesting here uh, in the Hebrew, what's being used here and its prominence is given actually to exalt. So this is interesting. It's not based on an emotion. We are to exalt him. So the actual, when we see rejoice, it's an interesting thing because we're thinking, you know, happy, good times, right? But actually, the joy here is actually exalting the one who is um, that the whole plan of redemption is a, a pointing to. And we are to, as a part of that, um, uh, to celebrate in an exalting way, um, which is really interesting because that's what you would give to uh, to a bride um, when the bridegroom is tearing, you know, exalt the bridegroom. This is what you now need to focus on. And, and so this journey of looking to him is essentially what it's actually pointing to, interestingly enough, here in the Torah. I mean, a really good example of this is when Yeshua was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will be done, Father, but your will be done and in that very statement he's exalting the father and you know there's this really interesting verse that in hebrews that says yeshua for the joy that was set before him endured the tar of the cross like i believe this is really pointing to his crushing in the garden of gethsemane how can messiah be finding joy in that moment when he's weeping and there's droplets of blood coming out his forehead yeah. So we've got a very interesting thing here is to understand something in this journey. And we're going to address this pointedly uh, in this teaching so that we really get away from how the modern English kind of gets us to read these words. Because here in, in Devarim, it's literally finishing with uh, so that you will be altogether joyful, that you will be altogether exulting the plan and the, again there's a real english uh there's a real reference here as to where joy in him may be truly found because if i'm actually going where is he there's an instruction here to exalt and so it's fascinating can we still have joy in the dress rehearsal in the sense of the plan of redemption by exalting and therefore joy in him can truly still occur and I believe we just experienced this as a wider community uh, at a beautiful level to see the level of joy in him that was actually there, even though Yom Teruah had not been fulfilled, despite how many people were claiming that it was going to be this year. Um, yet again, um, it had uh, the bridegroom um, uh, has tarried from our sense in the time domain, not from his sense and everything will happen exactly on time as he has planned it. But from our perspective, he's giving us a really interesting message here, what to do when he doesn't fulfill Yom Teruah. And there seems to be this pointing to an exalting to, to uh, celebrate, but it's particularly in him. It's not about us. 
And if we made it about us, it would be interesting how it would read differently in the Hebrew and we would see different words being used, but it's not. And so there's a very subtle thing here is, okay, you're not going to be happy <laughs> because I'm buried, but I want you now to focus this for the purpose of, I want you to still celebrate and to honor this. So here we are again. We saw the full moon. I mean, Jom Turu has not been fulfilled, literally. The bridegroom has not come to gather the living and the dead. Where is he? We ask this question, so what are we to do? And there's great promises of Elohim around understanding the whole prophetic nature of joy, rejoice, rejoicing, and all that sort of thing. So the message from the bridegroom, Michael. So joy in him. So we looked at the weeping bride. And now we're looking at joining him. How great is our Elohim? And there's a referency in all of this. And we put much of our music aside to this. And we'll continue to go through this in their prophetic understandings as we look at the series. So the joy in him. Wow. So is his joy about the pursuit of happiness? And as you were saying uh, earlier, Michael, that if joy is based on the emotional um, experience of feeling happy, we are not going to understand our faith, nor will we probably be able to honor it with a sense of joy. And in fact, we, if we make our faith emotionally based, we could end up in a lot of trouble. And we've seen this happen with a lot of various faith denominations and movements over the years, that it was based on emotional experience. It was not based on truly what the Torah is actually conveying, uh, what the, the prophets were actually conveying vein and what the Brit is actually conveying uh, in all of this, the New Testament, it actually isn't referring to an, an emotional. Now, there's nothing wrong with happiness, is there, Michael? We're not saying that there's anything, you know, the Father doesn't mind us being happy, okay? So we're not to walk around with doom and gloom, you know, and, and all this kind of a thing here. It's okay to be happy and to experience the emotion of happiness, but our faith is not to be based on the pursuit of happiness, and yet Western society and modern Western culture in particular has been on this pursuit of happiness. Now, if it brings its faith into that framework, we are going to end up with a lot of wonkiness, uh, particularly in the various expressions of, of the biblical faith that we have seen uh, unfold, particularly in Western society, where many of these movements have been based emotionally on happiness. And so we're making it very, very clear here. Nowhere in the scripture is it saying that our faith is based on the pursuit of being happy. <laughs> but happiness will be experienced as a part of our journey of faith. Um, and so when we make those clarities, you can start to see a little bit of the folly in some of these modern religious movements. Is that fair, Michael? Yeah. And, you know, look. If biblical joy, the outcome of it does bring the feeling of happiness, welcome it. But also remember, as Solomon would say, there's a time for all things. There's a time for weeping. There's a time for uh, and mourning. And there is a time to feel happy. You know, everything in its proper season. So, so joy. A feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Rejoice, feel, or show great joy or delight. Well, if rejoice is based on joy in the modern English, then it's all about happiness. Um, and so this is going to create a little bit of confusion when we read uh, all of the word uh, and how it relates to the plan of redemption. In Greek here, joy, rejoice, glad, exalt, these different words that are being used in the English here. Uh, and these are the words that you will see how the Greek is conveying. And in the Chai here, enjoy gladness, a joy received from you, a cause or occasion of joy of persons want, uh, who are one's joy. Uh, rejoice, to rejoice, be glad, to rejoice exceedingly, to dwell, to thrive in salutations. Hail, 
to give one greeting uh, and and uh, salute. And then we've got the Sakar here to rejoice, to take part in another's joy and rejoice all together to congratulate. Well, you, the Greek at least is digging in a little bit deeper here because if this is based on happiness, you're not going to be doing these things. You're not going to be giving the salutations. You know, you're not going to be giving the greetings. You want to because I don't feel like it. I'm not happy. Stuff them, and and so you're not going to be performing. So the Greek is capturing this at a little bit deeper level than the English does. And then, of course, one of my favorite expressions here in the uh, Alegaleo, um, to exult. Again, this is very closer to some of what the Hebrew is actually getting across. Rejoice exceedingly, be exceedingly glad. And it's based on exalting the source of this and the reason for it. So then that brings us now to the Hebrew. So in the Hebrew, the noun form simcha, joy, mirth, gladness, gaiety, pleasure, joy. Now, here's what's interesting. The joy of Elohim. Elohim experiences joy. Um, a glad result, a happy issue. So here you see a causal effect for joy. Where is the English joy and rejoicing? It's actually, it's actually very self-centered, isn't it, Curtis? It, it doesn't take into account. It's me, me, me. I feel happy or I don't feel happy. Even the Greek captures some of the actual wider body dynamic uh, and the causal effect of joy. The Hebrew does as well. And as we go through the series, you're going to see these uh, four verbs, uh, which in the English, you just see rejoice, rejoice, or make glad. There's actually four main verbs being used. Samach, again, this is the root, the verbal form of simcha, um, to exalt, again, this exaltation, to rejoice religiously. And we don't mean in a religious man-made sense here. It, it's speaking usually um, revolving the appointed times, actually, to cause to rejoice, to gladden, make glad. Uh, you have sus and its uh, derivative sason or masos, to exult, to rejoice, to exalt, to display joy. So you're seeing that joy is an outcome of something here. Like there's a causal uh, reason for joy. Uh, gul or gil, to rejoice, be glad. Now, this is really interesting, to rejoice with trembling. And we're going to see the verse that uh, us really uses this, but this is this idea of fear and rever reverence. So right here, we're seeing that actually you have a joy that's not based upon the feeling of happiness. I don't know about you, Curtis, but when I'm in a fear of trembling and reverence, I don't automatically attach the feeling of happiness to that. Um, and then the word alas, which I know is your favorite Hebrew one here, Curtis, to exalt, to rejoice, and this idea of triumph. Triumph. I remember at uh, Sukkot when I had the branch and the golf cart and I mentioned it to there and uh, I was late. Well, not late, but because the, there was two young men that were saving me with a golf cart. But I had forgotten my branch to get into Sukkot and I'd made the rule that you don't get in unless you have your branch. <laughs> of course, I'm without my branch. And so I'd gone back to the cabin to get the branch and these two young men saved me with the golf cart. I said, I need your help. So they rushed me back got the branch and then drove me back. And as I was driving in and we were about to uh, start the teaching in, in, in a few minutes, I was uh, holding up the branch going for the house of Israel. <laughs> and, and literally this uh, silly expression, you know, of holding a branch on a golf cart, you know, and you just gotta, you know, imagine the early disciples and certainly the prophets and, and that scene, how, you know, <laughs> look at these idiots. But the thing is, is that, there was an exalting and rejoice, but there was also a sense of the triumph, the Allahs, um, because all of a sudden my joy wasn't found in my circumstance because quite frankly, uh, you know, I was in a kerfuffle. <laughs> but I was still enjoying the exalting and the rejoicing, even amongst the kerfuffle, which doesn't bring generally a lot of happiness in and of itself. But it is interesting when the Hebrew digs deeper and we reflect this and rejoice in the English, how exalt, you, you know, and the um, it, literally the Simcha captures maybe a bit more of the emotional. But if you look at the rest of the Hebrew in this, exalt, 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 exalt. And it's really quite interesting um, when we look at this. 
uh, concerning the word. So joy in him. True shalom is found only in our joy in him. Shalom, we believe, Michael and I believe, is directly, and through this series you will see this, that true shalom is actually found in him. And it, this is the shalom or the joy that surpasses all understanding. This is the place where it's not based on feeling happy. And so when it makes statements like, you know, um, reading the scripture that, you know, the joy that surpasses all understanding and things like that, it'll start to make a bit more sense when it's not emotionally based. And uh, and so this is very important things. The fruit of the spirit is an outcome. It is it is not the pursuit. This is this true Hebrew joy versus the pursuit of happiness. The fruit of the spirit is actually an outcome, a tree, a proper cultivated tree, pruned tree, a healthy tree that has the living waters, all those sorts of things produces fruit. <laughs> it's literally good fruit is an outcome of something that is in the right place. Uh, and so we are to understand that fruit is actually an outward expression of something that is uh, in a good state. Testing, afflictions, trials, and tribulations. What has all of this got to do with joy if the definition of joy is happiness? <laughs> you, you know, like this is crazy. You know, we're looking at scripture and it's like, well, we've got this testing, afflictions, trials, and tribulation. Indeed, even the great tribulation. And somehow we're to have joy amongst all of this, Michael. You know, can this truly be emotionally based? True faith can be manufactured. True faith cannot be manufactured or faked. Faith, hope, and love in their essence. And Michael and I have talked about this at great, great length. Actual faith, actual hope, a confident expectation of something that is good. And love, agape, literally unconditional love. These three things cannot be faked or manufactured. And it's very, very important that when it says the greatest of these, when when the Apostle Paul was saying the greatest of these is faith, hope, and love, he is talking about the ultimate expression of someone's journey. This actually can't be faked. You're not going to see a lot of bad fruit and a lot of bad behavior if these three aren't being faked. Because you've got the ultimate confident expectation of something that is good. You've got the unconditional love of, of Elohim throwing, uh, throwing through us, and we literally are anchored in the true faith. That will only produce a good witness. It can do nothing else. And this is why the Apostle Paul would relate to it in such a way. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Michael and I, man, we, we went down some real rabbit holes on this and we had to take them out of the teaching because it's incredible. Like when you, I, I mean, and we were looking at this, were we, Michael? It's just like, it really is. This isn't just some glib statement, you know, all oh, these ways are not our ways. <laughs> like we really don't get this. We are constantly making Elohim fit our little mind boxes and our religious traditions and our journeys and everything else. And, and we are doing this and we've been guilty since Sinai. Is that fair, Michael? Yeah. And I mean, just to give an example, you, you mentioned on the second point, Curtis, that like the fruit on a tree is the outcome. Well, it's the outcome of what? Tilling the ground, watering the tree, pruning the branches, hacking it back every now and then. Well, if that's the shadow picture and we are told that we're trees, either we're firmly rooted by the river or we're not, well, then where's the tilling of the ground in our lives and the pruning of our lives and the watering in our lives? Thus, fruit becomes an outcome. Now we start to see where maybe testing, affliction, and trials, you mean that these things can lead to joy, true biblical joy? Do we really rejoice if that we he is sat on the throne? I mean, truly, I, Curtis, especially if his way of doing things doesn't, you know, line up to our expectations and desires. I think the Hebrew Allah's captures that. I, I think that ultimately, if we are truly in the Allah's position, then he is on the throne and not us. And therefore, the plan of redemption is assured. And we can look to those things regardless of the circumstance. And this is where we really need to understand that aspect of biblical prophecy. 
you know, in and of itself, that actually this is not our little interpretations and everything else. And I often say to people as they go through their journey and they're looking deeper, they might have questions that they think are good or aren't answered or even contradiction in scripture. And I say to be every time you see a supposed contradiction in scripture, know that there is an actual pearl to be found um, in, in all of this. And Michael and I are going to mention this uh, probably in the next part of this series, just in relationship to a uh, supposed contradiction as it related to King David um, and King David. And so, but there's pearls to be found in this um, if we're in a laws um, and on this, because then it will all go back to him. And I believe, we believe joining him and why Shalom is truly found in that is that suddenly you start to take peace in that, regardless of what's unfolding around us. And given the current state of the world right now, we all need to get this in the community, what we're discussing today in a big way. Because then we can experience all the various factions of joy being mentioned, particularly uh, in the Hebrew uh, and a lot captured in the Greek of joy in his kingship, that he's actually at the helm. And we, and we are going to need a constant reminder and understanding of this so that we can trust in him and his plan of redemption, despite what is going on in our personal life, challenges, trials, tribulation, and of course, the, the world uh, in the wider sense. All right, I'll get you to read this endeavor, Michael. Okay, so Deuteronomy 28, 47, 48. This is actually part of the curses. And we're not going to read all the curses because there's quite a few of them. But he says, if you do not obey my covenant, these things will happen. And then he gives a qual uh, quantifier here. Because you did not serve Yah, your Elohim, with joyfulness and gladness of heart. The word there, joyfulness, is the word simcha. Because of the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom Yah will send against you in hunger and in thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. So you, you see, when you read the wider context of this passage, you're essentially seeing an ungrateful people. Like Yah has done all these things for them. And they've not been appreciative and they've not actually um, served him with the joyfulness that he's due. And you see this kind of attitude of, if he'll say elsewhere, do not think that you got all these blessings by the power of your hand. And so we see everything that our Elohim is doing, but we're, we're very forgetful creatures generally. And it doesn't take long for us to start you know, ultimately glorifying ourselves and our so-called own abilities. And he says, if you get to this space, I will put upon the, upon you the yoke of your enemies. Because, you know, it's almost as if when people take things for granted and they start going, oh, woe is me, woe is me, and oh, look at everything that's happening to me, and actually they're in a very good place. Yah, was, Yah says, fine, if you think you're in a bad place, let's see about that. And are we actually seeing a shadow picture to something far greater? You know, the Torah, the Torah uh, Hebrew says the Torah is a shadow of the good things to come. What are we, what is the shadow picture of this? You know, it's interesting what may have occurred outside the time domain it may have been this very thing. And we actually have to learn this lesson. Was Elohim taken for granted outside the time domain? What actually went down? And there's some very big things here. And there was some rabbit holes, not right, that Michael and I were not going to go down in this series. But there is some very big things to consider here in the Torah as to why we are experiencing any of this at all. And what lessons do we really have to learn as a part of the test? Uh, and as a part of the time domain, which I believe that King Solomon and in, in, in particularly expressed uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, um, with him constantly referencing the haval or the temporary nature of it all and for the reason for it. Um, just because it's temporary, what we're experiencing doesn't mean it doesn't have great meaning and in fact, great eternal meaning. And, and this is why I would make a statement is joy intrinsic 
to the plan of redemption an evil even a bridal journey because yah says because you did not serve with joy so if we have a skewed understanding of joy are we robbing ourselves of one of the big lessons that we're actually here in the time domain for yeah and one day we may do a teaching on this as to how actually understanding this at the levels we need to may be a requirement for eternity itself it's this big and and what he's actually creating uh in the eternal sense or once we get past the time domain great plan of redemption now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve Yah with fear and rejoice with trembling. That would seem like an oxymoron with a modern connotation. <laughs> you know, um, kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him, who take refuge in Messiah, in his plan of redemption. The word Giel there in the Hebrew is very interesting because what's being talked about here, and again, in a modern English context, this would seem like an oxymoron, but it is not at all. This has everything to do with exalting him. And it's very important, that the, and there's a reverence with this and, and the importance of this. And, of course, the psalmist here uh, in King David is, is very aware of this from the king's position. But the point we make here in the note here is reverence of Yah, is this gil of Yah, does this actually bring protection? That if we're actually in this place, if we are pleasing to him, if we are in right standing, can this actually bring protection? And what's very interesting is that the scripture we've just read in Deuteronomy, Yah says, this is happening to you because you did not serve Yah with gladness of heart, with rejoicing. King David is now saying, by the way, not only do you need to do it with rejoicing, with Gil, but it needs to have a healthy dose of fear and reverence injected into it. And again, like, are we serving him without fear, without respect? Because I think this is what the Torah is warning us of, you know, because you didn't do this. And are we seeing religious dominate denomination saying, oh, we serve Yah, we serve Yah. And there's zero fear and reverence of the king himself because self is on the throne. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in this series. Um, joy in his truth and overcoming here. So I'll get you to read this, Michael. Psalm 43. So the context of this Psalm, David is saying, uh, why are you depressed? Oh, my being, why are you, uh, why are you trembling within me? Like David is experiencing some serious emotional turmoil. And then he says this, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of Elohim, to Elohim of my exceeding joy. This is uh, the word simcha here. And we're actually, the English says exceeding joy. In the Hebrew, you have simcha and gul next to each other. It's literally saying my joy of all joys would be a better English way of doing it. And I will praise you with the liar, O Elohim, my Elohim. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope or endure in Elohim, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my Elohim. Now, here's something, we'll get more into this when we look at King David a bit more, but King David was not the one to build the temple of Elohim. It was his son, his son Solomon, that was to do this. So David is saying, in the context of being depressed and in turmoil and being cast down, the remedy for that is Yah's light and Yah's truth, which you will find in his scripture, in his covenant. And he's saying that the light and the truth or, you know, as Messiah would say, I am the lie, I am the truth, that will lead him to his set-apart mountain. 
David is speaking in an eternal perspective here. He's speaking in a context of being resurrected because David knew he wasn't going to be the one to build the altar. In fact, he was afraid to offer at the altar of Elohim because of uh, a transgression he did, which we'll get into. So David is understanding that the remedy to his being cast down, to the turmoil within him, is Yah's light and truth which would ultimately manifest it as Messiah, and that this would bring him to the true altar of Elohim, an altar yet to come. And it's interesting, as his nefesh is in turmoil here, the, the, the context, the way we'd express this in modern terms, is often depression. And what David is saying, the antidote to this is to literally be in the simcha, the gil, exceedingly. So this, this exceeding place of exalting is actually a part of overcoming depression. And he's actually relaying this. Oh, my soul. Oh, my nefesh. Why are you in turmoil within me? I shall, it's a conscious statement. I shall again praise him my salvation, my Elohim. Well, of course, Yehoshua, the full expression of the name Yehoshua is Elohim is my salvation. It's a beautiful thing. My Yeshua, my Elohim, my Yehoshua. And, and so this is a beautiful thing that is occurring here um, as to how we're to deal with this. And so even though modern uh, pharmacia would say that, you know, the solution to this is found in a bottle, um, David is saying, no, the solution to this is exceeding simcha and gil. <laughs> this is the way you go to deal with it. And hopefully this passage really illuminates the fact that to exalt Elohim does not mean being happy clappy because David was in a really bad state and he's saying, I will exalt my Elohim despite what's going on in the battleground of my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And so this was, uh, again, David is saying my circumstances do not determine what I need, you know, the choice, the sovereign choice of uh, what I need to do. But if you're not anchored, in the true faith, this is going to be a very difficult thing, especially in um, what would not be an emotional state of happiness. Psalm 97, one, Yah reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let many coastlands be glad. Gil, exalt with trembling. Let me get this straight. Yah reigns. So we got a statement here of something, Michael, isn't it? The last great day, the thousand year reign. We got, you know, David saying here, Yah reigns, let the earth, what? Exalt with trembling. That's what it's, you know, this exalt with trembling. Let the many coastlands be glad. The Sama. Now let them <laughs> be gladdened as a result of this. And this is interesting. Rejoice and be glad. You would just think it was all just one big happy experience going on here. And yet, no, it's saying let the earth do something that is uh, attached to great reverence regarding the reign of Messiah. Is that fair? Well, think about this. How does the kingdom of Yah get established? There's going to be a lot of pain before this. I mean, let's remember when when messiah touches down the the mount of olives is going to split in two there's you know there's going to be a great treading of the wine press there's going to be a lot of destruction when the wrath of elohim is poured out and those that very small remnant of the mortal seed pool yes they're going to be exceedingly glad to have been able to come into his kingdom but i can guarantee you they will be trembling there will be reverence down to the bones because they know what it took for Yah's reign to be established. Yeah. Psalm 97 continues. If you drop down to verse eight and nine. So again, the context is Yah's reigning. Okay. His kingdom is established. Zion hears and is glad. The word Samach here. And the daughters of Judah, they rejoice. Now, the word there for rejoice is gil or gul, to rejoice with trembling, 
Well, why would they be trembling? Because of your judgments, O Yah. For you, O Yah, a most high over all the earth, you are exalted far above all the gods. So again, you're seeing this. Um, I actually believe you're seeing two groups of people here. You're seeing Zion and those that are allowed to dwell in it. And you see Zion and da uh, Judah's daughters. And I, I, without getting into the details, I believe you're seeing a bride and the eternal family. The bride is going to be glad. She will rejoice exceedingly. The daughters of Judah, however, I believe they will rejoice with trembling. Why? Because of the judgments. I believe you're seeing a statement of perfect love casts out all fear here for Zion. And I, without getting into the details, I believe it's uh, the bride of Messiah will is what it is speaking of with Zion. But it, again, th there's reverence all in this. Well, the context is his righteous judgment. So what makes it righteous? You know, and we talk about that in the judgment series. You know, there's, there's a lot to this that, you know, again, um, but we, we reflect on this a lot more in the judgment series, uh, the great judgment series of just what is actually occurring. Um, and it's very, very serious. We, um, in the sense of, um, his righteous judgment and how we are to reflect upon that and its various ways that this is going to play out in a prophetic sense here in the Psalm. Okay. So it goes on. Oh, you who love Yah and hate evil, he preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. So something has gone down here prophetically, and there's going to be something that's, there's a deliverance, which is the whole, uh, right throughout scripture, the deliverance of the house of Israel. Light is sown for the righteous and the joy now there is this sense for the upright in heart. There is a celebratory type of joy being here in the Hebrew that actually does relate to um, this aspect or includes this aspect of happiness. Rejoice in Yah, O righteous, and give thanks to his set-apart name. So there's going to be this aspect of where we are seeing the great joy because of the essence of deliverance that has come about from righteous judgment. We're actually going to celebrate this fact <laughs> on the and earth. And it says to give thanks to his set apart name, think his authority. Like the Hebraic concept of name is character, but more importantly, authority. Do we truly rejoice in his authority? Remember, I, I want to say this, authority and submission are, are linked. You can't separate the two. Submission is only submission when you don't agree with it. Up until that point, it's agreement, you know, and can we truly give thanks and have joy in his authority, especially when it seems to go against what we would like? And this now gets into this thing of his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Ah. Uh, Hey, Prophet Joel. If you read the context of this chapter, again, you're seeing the fulfillment of the four Moedim, and you actually see four Moedim allusions right in this passage. It says, be glad, O children of Zion. The word there again, gil, to rejoice with trembling, and rejoice uh, in Yah your Elohim, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats are, shall overflow with wine and oil. This, this is appointed time language. Remember what it said when it commanded us in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 15, when you have your you have brought in the produce of your threshing floors and of the fruit of the trees, that like this is the vats overflowing, the threshing floors, like, and you're seeing these um full moedim illusions, full harvest illusions, and you're see like think about what threshing is, you know. You're beating this thing to separate wheat from chaff, and then the vats, the crushing. The fruit of that is overflowing. 
And it's in that context that the children of Zion are told to rejoice with trembling, to exult. And so this is where we have this exalting in the fulfillment of the actual plan of redemption. But we are to do this with reverence. And there is a trembling attached to it. And so it's very interesting. Rejoice in Yahushua. Now God here through it. Though the fig tree shall not blossom. Of course, we know the fig tree, this allusion to this house of Israel, nor fruit beyond the vines. The produce of the olives fail. So we've got some interesting stuff happening here in this Moedine language. <laughs> and the fields yield no food and the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice. And this is what I love. Allah's. I will exult. Because there's a triumph. Regardless of our state, there is going to be a plan of redemption that's going to unfold here. And, and in Habakkuk, we've got this incredible understanding. Yet I will rejoice. Yet I will Allah's. Because he knows that despite our state, something great is going to unfold upon the earth. I will take joy. I will take yield, trembling and exalt, Elohim of my salvation. In other words, I am going, that a whole plan of redemption here, regardless of our state, is pointing to Yehoshua. And there's literally going to be an Allah, a Gail, that is actually being stated here by Habakkuk. He absolutely understood that in the, regardless of how depressing the state of the house of Israel is and what's going on here, I am going to exult and know who is on the throne and know that this is all going to lead and be fulfilled according to his plan of redemption. And, um, and also, too, I've got here in the footnote, the prophet Hosea also lived in this space. They had to. The state of things weren't that great. <laughs> you know, there's literally some stuff that's got to come down here and it's not good. And yet here we are coming to the end of the age and the state of the house of Israel is not that great. We've, we, 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 we're going to need the fulfillment of the fall appointed times uh, in order that we get to this uh, position or this place um, of, of where, uh, where Yehoshua is taking us all to. And so again, when we think of ourselves something that we're not, when we think we're all so wonderful, when we think we know all so much, when we think that our traditions are the things that are wrong, when we think all of these things about ourselves and we don't humble ourselves to the place to understand that we are not in the place that he wants us to be, then we don't even understand these passages uh, and what, you know, uh, the state of the house of Israel was at the time when Habakkuk wrote this, when Hosea was dealing with, indeed, Jeremiah. Um all of these guys, and now here we are at the end of the age. And I'll tell you what, Michael, I read that, and I can't think of a better thing yet. I will rejoice because right now the only thing I can rejoice in is we've got the coming of the end of the age and the fulfillment of his fall Moedim. And I know exactly what Habakkuk is meaning at this point because I'm looking around going the state of things and the state of the house of Israel is perhaps not in a place of um, Elaz and Gil. You know, and what's really interesting, just like, you know me, Curtis, I geek out on, on grammar and stuff, but the name Hosea, you're actually seeing this captured within the very name. Uh, the Hebrew is Hoshia. And dependent, like, it, one of the ways to look at that is actually that Hosea means I, it, I will be saved, I will be delivered. It, it comes from the same root as, you know, Yeshua. But Again, like it's in the cause, you can say it's in the causal form, but Hosea's name literally being, I will be saved. So it's very interesting, despite what was going on in Hosea. This is what Habakkuk is saying. Despite all of this, Yah will save me. Yah will save his people. Yeah. And that is ultimately where it gets back to what Paul was referencing, who was a master at, at not only the Torah, but also the prophets. Um, he literally knows to speak to this faith, hope, and love. The understanding the faith and what it's anchored in, the hope that comes with that, a confident expectation of what Yah is doing, and knowing that he has agape is attached to all of this. And these great prophets are in that firm position of faith, hope, and love. Firmly. 
uh, as they deliver these words. Ecclesiastes 13, 16 here. Better was a poor and a wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with the youth and who stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people and of whom he led. Yet those who came later will not rejoice in him. Surely this is all chaval, or vanity in the English here, and striving after wind. What is going on here in this connection to Zechariah? So this is, I, I cover this in the Ecclesiastes teaching, but I believe we're seeing right there a typology of Messiah and the Bride. Now, you, Michael, how do you get there? You always talk about the bride. The, like It says that he was poor and he was wise. Now, think blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So you have this poor, wise youth. Um, well, first, you've got this foolish king who's no longer taking advice. You know, think of all the warnings in the prophets to the kings of the earth. And it says that, this poor but wise youth went from prison to the throne. Think of, uh, you know, Yeshua by his resurrection, he opened the prison of Sheol. Like, you're no longer bound by death. And so he goes from death and he ascends to the throne. And then it says, I saw all the living who move about under the sun. So this is still within the 7,000 uh, year plan of redemption it's still within time along with the youth who was to stand in the king's place there was no end of all the people and curtis you talk a lot about how you think it's overpopulated now wait till the millennial reign there's going to be no end of all the people of whom he led think of messiah the torah going forth to all the nations yet those who come later those who will um, be born into the millennial reign, who will take King Yeshua on the throne for granted, and they will not rejoice in him. And think about that, again, back to the warning in Deuteronomy 28, because you did not serve Yah with gladness of heart. Are we going to see this repeat again in the millennial reign? And we know that the attack we do not believe the attack will be on Yeshua at the end of the millennial reign. It will be on his bride. And we see in this in Zechariah 14 that those who will not honor the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot, which is about, it's, it's essentially the wedding, a celebration of the wedding that took place. And are we seeing in Solomon's words a typology of what is yet to come in the millennial reign? I think the pro the prophecy here is undeniable, especially if we understand in Revelation where it talks about the numbers will be the sands of the seas that rebel at the end of all of this. There is a prophetic position here of where uh, the ultimate state or the fallen state and people taking for granted what they actually have is going to play its fullest expression right at the end. Um, before um, we head to the great white throne judgment. And indeed, the time domain is no more. So there is a full expression, a full sovereignty that is going to play out, that is playing out now and has the last 6,000 years and will play out during the whole millennial reign. And I often make the statement, in fact, it's possible that the delivery of the true gospel will be even more important and harder in the sense for those who take for granted King Yeshua and the bridal governance, because it will be normal to them. And anything that becomes normal to us, anything that we become overly acquainted with, that is where the fallen state tends to take that for granted um, because it's normal and, and, and so on and so on. What's really interesting, it doesn't say that they won't serve him. It says that they will not rejoice in him. And what was the warning in Torah? Because you did not serve with gladness. It doesn't say because you didn't serve, because you didn't do so with gladness. And are we seeing an illusion here that 
again, like, is it really about the obedience that he's really looking at, or is it the motivation and the drivers for said obedience? Yeah. And so all of that plays out to what is the state of the nefesh. You know, we we are we've only known the position of the fulfillment of the fall moedim. We don't know the post position of those born into the millennial reign where it has actually occurred. And now they're post this and suddenly there might be an obedience in the picture. But is it being done at the nefesh level in the way that is pleasing to Elohim? And it would suggest, like I say, is recorded in the book of Revelation. No, it's not. And, and and that's almost unfathomable for some of us on this side of the fulfillment of the fall mode going, how can they possibly take the king for granted? He's literally here and 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 a, and a proper ruling governance, you know, which is the bridal shadow picture. This is the governance of Messiah. And he's going to choose that which will govern with him, that that which he can trust because he is not going to take to the altar of the plan of redemption, which is what the bridal picture is representing. He is not going to take like any more in our shadow picture. You don't take someone to the altar who you don't trust. It's that simple. So there's something for us to really understand this in the sense of what the Hebrew is pointing out regarding particularly the Gil and the Elaz. Um, Okay, Romans 5, 10, 11 here. So what does the early Kahal have to say about all of this? All right, so, you know, they, they're they operating. They don't have their printed New Testaments yet. They're all operating off the Torah and the prophets. How did they understand it um, uh, culturally and being raised and educated in Torah and the prophets and living out the Moedim and all these sorts of things um, and, and the religious establishment at the time and everything that they'd been through as a house of Israel up until that point? For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to Elohim by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in Elohim through our master, Yeshua Messiah, whom we have now received reconciliation. So they're attaching this, Michael, to reconciliation, being reconciled. Is this just a happy, clappy emotion thing going on here? Well, what's really interesting as well is that when we read this, we think about being reconciled to Elohim. You know, yeah, we, we were fallen and there's a separation at the fall and we, we long for the reconciliation with Elohim. Yes, that's true. And that would be, I, I, I say this, I don't say this in a derogatory sense, but that is the surface level understanding. Is there actually this idea of being reconciled to one another? You know, and because we were enemies, but now through what Messiah has done by his word, by his spirit, um, by his commands of discipleship, are we being reconciled to one another so that the body may come into unity? You know, as Yeshua would say, let them be one as we are one, Father. And by this reconciliation, the outcome of that should be joy. And to me, I, I don't know about you, Curtis, but I do believe there's a body dynamic to this statement in the same way that the love of Elohim, if you claim to love Elohim, but you can't love your brother, then you're lying. Well, does reconciliation play uh, the same part? We have to be reconciled with one another before we can even be reconciled to Elohim. To put this in plain language, I'm seeing we're seeing the great prophe prophecies of Ezekiel where the two sticks are becoming one. There is reference, I believe, here in how Paul understood that restoration of the house of Israel. And so we've gone from enemies to brothers to now the eternal joy uh, in him as a result. And he's re referencing it this way. You are seeing the post understanding of the reconciliation or the two houses being brought together and restored in, in uh, these two factions, the, the scattered tribes, uh, Judah and the house of Israel coming together and the fulfillment of, of Ezekiel, essentially. Uh, and mentioned by the great prophet Ezekiel. And so we are seeing um, as a part of this reconciliation, and the Greek is capturing the Kokokomai here, the um, 
the, to glory, to give an account of a thing. Well, what are we giving an account of? His plan of redemption. <laughs> he's saying the restoration of the house is all captured in the great plan of redemption and what this is all about. And so it's a, it, you know, Paul's master's mastery of understanding things, you know, to even capture uh, the essence of of the prophecies of Ezekiel and the restoration uh, of the house and the two sticks coming together. He's just literally speaking language that's at a level that we just don't really understand when we're reading even things like the book of Romans. He's speaking at a level that is so advanced, um, yet commonly understood by his audience that was raised in Torah and the prophets. But because we haven't been traditionally, certainly on the Christian side of the riverbank, we're not understanding um, just the depth of the words that are coming out of the Apostle Paul here uh, as it relates to the plan of redemption and the restoration of the house of Israel. And, you know, Curtis, we got to experience a shadow, well, not even a shadow picture, but I believe we got to experience this at Sukkot because... Yeah. First of all, Sukkot was a time of rejoicing. It was absolutely splendid. And so we're glorying on the account of his plan of redemption that we're honoring. But the reckon the joy that I felt from fellowshipping with other brothers and sisters, what was it that I'm truly uh, giving exaltation to? And I would argue it's the work that he's doing in this community. Why is it that we have such unity? Why is it that there's such good fruit? Because it's not coming from you and I, Curtis. You know, what is it that we, we're we glorying and exalting what he's done in us? And yeah. by him circumcising our hearts, I, I believe we got to, we're experiencing the fruit of reconciliation. Yeah, it's the outcome of what he's doing in our wider community. And and we got a chance to glimpse that at Sukkot, you know, and like I say, I think a shadow picture of the fulfillment of the actual Moedim, because we're all meeting on Zoom and our wider communities. We try to get together as we can on Shabbat to the appointed times. But when you're suddenly all thrusted together in person, it's like the shadow picture. If the Zoom is the time domain where we were thrusted into the eternal picture together. And you, when you saw the hope and faith and love that came with that, it was incredible, you know, and, um, and again, he's just giving us a glimpse, you know, of what he's doing and, uh, and we're not to steal his glory. Um, and uh, we're here to help each other all be in a place of teshuva, uh, that we may walk in a place of repentance and grapple with these matters. In Romans 12, 9, uh, 9 12 here goes on to say, let, uh, let love be genuine. And so, indeed, we experience that. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Phileo, with phileo affection. Outdo one another in showing the honor. Outdo one another in phileo. This is interesting. Do not be softful in the zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the master. Look at this. Rejoice in hope. The charo here to rejoice exceedingly salutations, hail, greeting one another. My goodness, did we live this at Sukkot. It was unbelievable how we live the charo being expressed here in the Greek and Romans, not because it was manufactured and not because we told everybody this is how you have to greet one another. It was naturally occurring. You couldn't have stopped this no matter how hard you try with what we were witnessing. And as a result, we're all in a place of constant prayer. As a result, we are literally praising Yeshua. Your nefesh is doing it, whether you want to or not, <laughs> or whether you're thinking about it or not would be the best way to put it. You're literally living in a place of with the Greek, or this place of Allah's. You're living that place. Um, because it's a natural expression of what Romans is trying to convey here regarding the love that was was actually occurring. And this is the stuff that you don't manufacture. And, you know, it says rejoice in hope. And, Curtis, you say this a lot. Hope is better understood as a confident expectation, you know, the essence of faith. 
And if you've got issues there, how are you going to rejoice in it? How are you going to have that joy and shalom that does surpass all understanding? Like Again, these things cannot be manufactured, which is why Paul would say, let your love be genuine. We always think, at least I did, when I were used to read that statement, let love be genuine, I used to think it meant in terms of uh, without hypocrisy, you know, like this kind of pleasing people's faces as it were. But when I read this now in the context of this teaching, Paul is saying you can't manufacture this. Is your love genuine? Yeah. And we have the note there basically saying often in our religious or ceremonial or liturgical prayers, we are trying to manufacture it. And so this is the sort of thing where if we choose the counterfeit versus the outcome or the fruit of the real, they're vastly different things. We can manufacture the religious gatherings and the ceremonial uh, motions and actions and the liturgical prayers that go with all of it. But does this literally, is this literally what is being mentioned here in Romans? Is this really what it's about? Or are we actually seeing the outcome or the fruit of something? And uh, and we believe that that's where it really sits here. In Romans 14, 7, for the kingdom of Elohim is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Ruach. So this is interesting. Again, not based on just ceremonial, liturgical, all these kinds of things that we do when we come together. Because when we come together for the Moedim, uh, when we come together to honor them, we have a lot of eating and drinking and things that are going on. And he's making the point, this is just not a matter of what we do at the feast, but of righteousness, his righteousness, his shalom, and then we're therefore the joy in his Ruach, in him. And so this is a very important, the, the, even the matter in which he lays this out. Again, he's speaking a language of, hey, this just isn't just about how we express celebrating the appointed times in our traditions. This is way more than this. This is getting to a matter of his righteousness, his shalom, and his joy. And so our joy then with the true faith starts to come in him. It's not that we don't attempt to manufacture it. It's not a religious expression. It is truly an outcome. And again, we focus on the religious expression, hoping that we might have some sort of outcome. <laughs> and, and literally, if we actually worked on the, you know, loaded on the front end uh, and got over ourselves, we might actually start to experience the stuff these guys are talking about. Is that fair, Michael? Yeah. And again, this should put into sharper focus Yeshua's warning, you know, don't raise your traditions and expressions equal to or above my word because if not we're robbing our like we're not focusing on his righteousness because it's self-righteousness there's no peace because we're dividing and the body and doing violence to his appointed times and thus we rob ourselves of that joy and if right. that joy is a bridal component again are we blinding ourselves and robbing ourselves of, of a bridal journey this is how serious it is yeah, it, it's more than this whole thing because we think, well, if we just go ahead and do this, you know, obedience for obedience sake, then we get a chance at feeling happy because we all got together. But there are many people that get together every year in obedience to honor the appointed times, and there's nothing but misery. You know, I, I, I have seen just terrible things and violence done at the Moedim because people are are trying to do something because they know it's the right thing to do. We know that that um, that the faith has not been done away with. We are to come together. We are to honor the Torah. But they we're saying there's a place here where that we're to understand we're not fulfilling a religious ceremony. We are actually honoring the Father's great plan of redemption, therefore understanding why we are coming together. And the outcome of that process and being in Teshuvah can be the garment preparation or the heart circumcision. And so this is very, very important that we get this the right way around. In fact, to the place where we started the teaching today, as we bring this to an end, um, where Messiah's warning that if you do this, if you get this the wrong way around, you actually... Um, uh, can prevent um, uh, the the true outcome, and um, and basically he was addressing the religious system at the time. You, you've you've got this the wrong way around. 
And, and there was a great consequence. It was getting paid for it. Indeed, the judgment of the whole system. And it didn't matter what factions, because there was various factions going on uh, almost 2,000 years ago with the, with the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, you know, some of those factions might have been in better standing than others. You know, who knows? We don't, we don't have the evidence of, but what we do know is all of it was judged in the end. It didn't matter what faction you were a part of. The temple came down. It just doesn't matter. You don't have excuses uh, for what was actually going on there and the great warnings of our master. It reminds me of the warning to one of the seven assemblies where it says, you think you're, you're, you're rich and, and all these things, but really you don't know that you're blind, you're naked and you're pitiable, you know, and I, this is what you're seeing again, when you sure was warning about these traditions he's referencing isaiah and he's saying this stuff will blind you you will fall into a spirit of deep sleep and if you're not focusing on his righteousness well where are your garments you know and again like our, unfortunately we see this yet again nothing new under the sun repeating itself May the Elohim of hope fill you with joy and shalom in believing so that by the power of the rock, you, you may abound in it. Now, this is interesting. A confident expectation in his plan, in him being on the throne, in what he is doing, will fill you with all joy. The Chara. This, you, the, you're going to experience a joy when you get this the right way. It's okay. I often say King's got it in hand. <laughs> you know, like we're living in a world right now where we better get this. King's got it. No matter, no matter how much of a mess this is turning into globally, he's got it. And we're to have a confident expectation of that so that we can still experience the outcome or the fruit of that, which is his joy and shalom. And so again, if our, Faith is based in feeling happy as the world starts to tremble and shake and plunge into the place that it's placing and indeed all our personal challenges and circumstances. This is almost impossible. <laughs> if, if we don't have truly a confident expectation in what he is doing, what he has done, what this is all about and the why for it all, this is going to be very difficult to have joy and shalom uh, as being expressed here in the Greek and Romans. And it's amazing how Paul is really making, he's saying this is true faith. This is true faith. We're going to, this is why I believe there will be a great falling away as stated by Paul. How did Paul know this? Because I, I believe this is my conjecture, but he's seeing religion versus faith and he's not seeing true joy. Yeah. He's seeing and, the manufacturing of religious ceremonies and everything else that goes with it. And in fact, t taking this theme further, 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. So again, what faith is the essence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 would say. So again, this thing, you know, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So again, here you've got this agalio and chara. It's literally saying you are exulting and rejoicing exceedingly with joy. Like th this is joy of joys again. It's inexpressible. It's filled with glory. Think of, anyway, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation or the deliverance of your souls, your beings. And, the garment so, preparation, literally the garment preparation of your nefesh. Mm. <laughs> it, it, this is why we're saying, is joy really that important of a topic? Because if it's linked to the salvation of the heart, the, remember Hebraically, soul, mind, heart, these things are all the same. And so the deliverance of your nefesh, this being linked with joy, with rejoicing this is why we've put in the note can you hijack your own repentance are you actually hijacking your own garment preparation whether willingly or unknowingly like this is why the self-pitying position is 
very dangerous spiritually. Or because- a pure works position, Martha Mary. Mm. You know, a, examples, a pure works, you know, got to get this, got to get, you know, and that's easy to get caught up in, especially if you're trying to host or facilitate an international Sukkot. I had to remind myself many a times during this way, whoa, 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 you know, like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't forget what this is really all about, even though you have obligations to serve, you know, in our modern Levitical sense in hosting a Sukkot. But Michael and I had to think about this quite a bit. You know, like is what we're serving going to steal this aspect and therefore it's hijacking our own reality, even as teaching and hosting. And, and of course, you know, but these things we're conscious of, but it's incredible how this can easily take us. It can actually it take us away. Now, there is responsibilities. There is things to do. There is servitude. There are all of these things. But we just don't want to be doing this at the expense of the why of it all. Certainly not be ruled emotionally while we do it. Yeah. Hopefully people now are starting to see that joy transcends emotion. Like emotion is an out. Again, if you feel happy because of true joy, then brilliant. But hopefully people are seeing that true joy is not dependent upon your circumstance. As Peter goes on to say, I'll let you take this one, Curtis. Yeah, and and again the uh, the agaglio here in the Greek, you know, very relatable to the Allahs in the Hebrew. It's this again to exalt is a very very important thing going on here uh, in the exalting. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Again, revisit the book of Ecclesiastes here. And so, and though someone strange is is uh, so as though something strange were happening to you. There's a purpose for this. It's not, you know, he's not just enjoying us all having a tough time. That's not what Yeshua is doing. <laughs> and he goes, but rejoice insofar as share Messiah's sufferings that you may also rejoice, be glad when his glory is revealed. Again, appointed times language, fulfillment of it. Again, that we may do this, but it's an exalting. It's a hope that is based on what he is doing. It is not based on circumstance and therefore the emotions that go with a fiery trial. Because I'm going to suggest to everybody here, okay, that one of the reasons being is that these people are struggling. They need to be lifted up because emotionally there's no way to be happy about their circumstances situation. It's not about that. But he's making the point here, okay, I don't expect you to be happy. Elohim's not expecting you to be happy right now. All of those sorts of things. But understand here, there's a greater thing now that you'll need to focus on in order that you may experience something. But it is a conscious choice based, truly grounded in a true faith that's grounded in the confident expectation of what he is doing. And so in order to be in that place during a fiery trial, we need to understand how this is being represented. Because again, you would say, well, how can I just manufacture being happy if everything's going wrong? Well, that's not what this is saying. And quite frankly, you can't. And you don't have an Elohim that's expecting you to be happy when a whole bunch of bad stuff's happening to you in your life. He's not sitting there going, you know, and I have seen people try to fake this. You know, they got something miserable happy in their lives and they're trying to put on the happy religious face. That's ridiculous. People know when I'm not happy. That doesn't mean that I'm not choosing to have joy in what the father's doing overall and the outcome or that I've even lost my shalom. I can be angry and not miss the mark. Actually, according to scripture, when you truly get this. You know, Yaakov will say that these fiery trials, like let endurance have its perfect work. Like these things are there to perfect you. They're there to bring you to full maturity. And that should bring joy, you know, like, so again, like when Yaakov is saying, count it all joy, I think we're going to read the scripture later, but count it all joy when these things come upon you. Like he's not saying be happy. He's saying, Let it have its work on you. That should bring joy. The fruit of overcoming, the fruit of the repentance that will follow. So you mean it's not based on the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy? (laughs) 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 Anyway, um, chosen by him. For we know 
brothers, loved by Elohim, that he has chosen you. Okay, this is bridal language. Again, this is this is the house of Israel language. This is all these sorts of things. Something's going on. He's saying, we know, we know this, brothers. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, not only in the Torah and the prophets, but also in power and in the Ruach with full conviction. In other words, with full authority. You know what kind of men we've proved to be among you for your sake. In other words, our character is not in question here. We're in good character. I often say to people, I'm not looking for your knowledge. Brother, sister, I want to see your character. I'm not looking for your struggles in the flesh and all the little boxes you've ticked or not, or your religious, how you carry out a religious ceremony. Who are you? Are you actually someone I can trust regardless of what you struggle with, regardless of what you're yet to overcome, regardless of how you carry out your religious ceremonies and whether they meet my, you know, stamp of approval? Who are you? And they're literally saying this, the kind of men that have proved to be among you for your sake so that they would listen that you become imitators of us and of the master. For you receive the word in much affliction. Man, if this is based on happiness, you're not going to be receiving anything. And you're certainly not going to have the joy that comes with the Ruach on this. You receive this in much affliction. And indeed, many people are here gathered in the community. And you've been gone through much affliction to get here. You might be experiencing afflictions and the challenge in your life right now. There is no way you're going through this based on emotions, that you're happy right now. It's something greater than this and what it's relating to here. we have gotten the note here, discipleship leads to join him. You better believe it does. Because in true discipleship environments, when you're in your twos and threes, even in your twelves, whatever it might be, there are things where you are helping a brother and a sister to get through a matter. And boy, I'll tell you what, if you want to find the joy that this is speaking about here, the char in the, in, in the Greek here, if you want to get to this place, man, the pattern of Messiah and what he laid down with discipleship is, is I can think of nothing that has provided that more in my life, Michael, than to help me through these matters. And so when he's saying be imitators of us, discipleship and of our master, what he patterned, that this is actually going to help us through the trials, the testings that are spoken about in the time domain. I mean, you know, is that fair? Does disciple? I mean, I don't know of anything in my life that has done it more than that. And of course, the helper sent to me through my wife. These are the things, but then that's the most intimate discipleship I have. So it's still all discipleship. Well, this is where it gets. If you look at the meaning, the cause or occasion of joy or of persons who are one's joy you know curtis i'm gonna say it you are part of my joy and i would hope that i'm part of your joy and the men i serve into they are my joy and i would hope that that's reciprocal what is the cause of occasion of that joy it's discipleship and so this is why paul's saying become you know become imitators of us and the master discipleship language for you receive the word in, in in much affliction, like it's literally Paul's literally saying, if you're not in some form of accountability here or imitation of those that have gone before you, you're going to struggle to receive the word, and you're going to struggle to receive it with joy, you know. And so, but I, I can testify. And I know many men that can testify. And in fact, they did at Sukkot. A lot of the men testified at Sukkot of the fruit of, you know, hopefully us imitating one another unto Messiah. Ah, there it is. So well. Yaakov or James as uh, King Jimmy uh, like to put in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, to be king, eh? <laughs> Count, Count. Joy. Count. Measure it. Measure it, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, so measure where you're at. Are you going, how are you going through this? And this is an interesting thing. And we do this in discipleship, don't we? We say, where are you at, brother? Ah, I'm miserable, or I'm angry, or I'm this, or I'm that, or, you know, and you go through it, and you're literally saying, well, where's your joy in this? 
is this going to be based just on how you feel or what you think or what someone did to you or they upset me or they offended me or I don't like their doctrine or whatever it is or they don't celebrate something that you know like like what's going on here like is is your emotions ruling you or can you count it can you measure what the scripture is actually trying to say because you're going to understand where you are at with the work he's done in you because if you can't do that there's not a lot of work that has been done Therefore, your ability to be a witness, especially in testing environments, is going to be very lacking. You're not going to be able to be used by him. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. In other words, this must occur. How can he use us otherwise to be worthy servants in all of this? If you're going to be emotionally based in your life, and we see a whole world right now failing that's based on emotions, everything we're seeing, pronouns, don't offend this person, don't do that. Everything's being based emotionally. And how does it look? It's horrific. If you tried to raise your kids based on whether the, your kids made you happy or not, you're got, you got a shock coming to you as parents. <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous. Like, why are we like our whole world is engulfed in the exact opposite of what the scripture is saying? And of course, because it is folly and it does not have the wisdom contained in the Torah and, and, and indeed in the prophets uh, and the foundations of our faith. Let steadfastness have its full effect, not your emotions, not your how you feel, not your happiness. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. For what? The role of servitude. If you don't get to this place, how can you expect to be used? If your whole way of representing your faith is based on how you feel, you cannot serve the kingdom. It must be on something that is real, that is directly related to the heart circumcision and the garment preparation of our nefesh. And therefore, it can be used regardless of whether you are happy, sad, or angry. I'm not a servant today because I'm happy. I'm not a servant today because I'm angry. I'm not a servant today because I'm sad. I'm a servant in the kingdom, and same with Michael, because of steadfastness. And if it wasn't based on that, I can assure you at four o'clock this morning and how I was feeling with no sleep, nothing, you know, you, 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 steadfastness is going to be the thing I'm going to take hope in at this point because it cannot even be based on how I was physically feeling. You know, and indeed, I've, you know, now, again, I'm not saying that I can, you know, anybody can get sick enough that they can't serve. But but the point being is, is that I've not been happy. <laughs> you know, to today. make it to use a bit more of a serious example, you know, Curtis, you and I as servant leaders and anyone that serves as a servant leader capacity will know you have to make some really tough decisions every now and then, like really tough decisions. And we don't enjoy making those decisions quite often we feel grieved we may even feel frustration as you're trying to plead with a brother or a sister because they're whatever but if we're not steadfast in that moment where's the joy like like i look back on some of the tough decisions i've had to make and yeah i wasn't happy through them but i counted joy that i was steadfast in them and more importantly i counted joy that i was in discipleship because man if i wasn't i would like discipleship has helped me remain steadfast as well and there is i look back and curtis i exult i sense almost you, you start getting to that thing of triumph and it's not our triumph, it's what he is doing in his people. Yeah, it, 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 just to, you know, like anything, we often want to be involved with that, which we don't understand. And then when we actually start to understand it, we wonder why we're involved. <laughs> Welcome to being a parent. Welcome to being a servant leader. Welcome to be, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that it's messy business dealing with, the um with dealing with the heart circumcision and the journey and we're not going to be able to do this based on our emotions of being happy or sad um we just can't we can't run a society that way we can't serve the kingdom that way we can't do anything based on now it's good that we have emotions he's designed us to experience emotions there's a reason for us uh to have that play out emotionally but we are not to make our decisions 
regarding the faith or matters that need to be attended to based on our emotions. Emotions don't give us truth and untruth. They're just giving us a feeling of what we're experiencing while we grapple with that. There is a big difference. The fact I'm happy doesn't mean that something is truth or the fact that I'm angry that something is untruth. I have learned over the years that things I've been happy about before thinking it was truth weren't. <laughs> and things that I was unhappy about thinking it was untrue that actually turned out to be true. <laughs> and so you need, you know, it, 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 emotions themselves will never tell you what is truth or untruth. And the whole world is trying to define that. If I feel happy, therefore it is true. This is folly and it will lead to the total destruction of modern society. And this is what will play out as we come to the end of the age. We are seeing the destruction occur and unfold in front of our eyes because of education systems, political systems and movements, right down to the decisions that are happening at the family nucleus level. It is all being based on how I feel. And that is total destruction. Absolute total destruction. We do not make decisions based on how we feel. If we're angry about something, Wisdom comes with working a matter through, not just reacting in anger. If we're happy about something, wisdom comes with working something through, not just because we're happy about something. If we're sad about something and grieving about something, wisdom will come. And with that wisdom, with that which is so precious, will come all the joy and rejoicing that is mentioned throughout the word in relationship to joy in him. So can we steal his joy? Not My his happiness. Not, not, his fe not his feeling of happy clappy, his actual joy. I mean, yes. remember in Isaiah 53, it says that it pleased Yah to crush Messiah. So, that, like, it, again, this is joy goes beyond even, I don't want to say our comprehension, but it goes beyond feeling. And so can we steal that joy? what joy is truly encapsulating in the scripture. Is the bridegroom, our master, our king, Messiah, is he literally trying to tell that which he loves and paid the price for and is a part of the now, the next coming age? Is he trying to say to us, think about this, you can actually steal my joy, you have that capacity. And I suggest to you, he doesn't plan on having something sit with him on the throne, the governance of the millennial reign of which that which is going to steal his joy. There is one person in this world that has such power, and I spoke about this last teaching, I'll just read it again here, that can steal my joy more than anybody on the face of the earth, and that's my wife. She can take it just like that. There are very few people that can do that. Very few people. That's how much power she wields. Whatever is going to govern with Messiah, this matter has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with and will be dealt with with that which he selects to be with him. Because not only is this just some rhetorical question, we believe it is absolutely essential. We can steal his joy. And that is not what he plans to rule and govern with. And so this is for all of us to digest and to chew through <laughs> um, in, in consideration with all these matters. So how can we steal his joy? Think about these things, how we honor him. Is it just tradition? Is it just liturgical prayers? Is it just however we want? Is it just disregarding the fact that he wants us to do it at all? I don't care what's out of wherever you're on. Do we honor him with our lips, but keep our hearts far from him? which is the warning in Isaiah that Yeshua quotes when saying, warning them about traditions. Again, how do we honor each other? Because John seems to think, and he's written it very explicitly for us, how we love one another is how we're going to love him. Are we whitewashed tombs? Have we become the very thing that Messiah was warning about? Have we scrubbed the outside of the tomb and I wear the nicest 
CTO'd or longest, or I rare them the right way. I I read the tour portions better than you do. I I honor Shabbat, you know, properly in the, you know, the way that I've understood it. I do this, I do that. Have we scrubbed these tombs so much? And yet, what is he really wanting here? Of course, he wants us to care about all of the things in, in matter of obedience and understanding his ways. But if it comes at the expense of dead man bones sitting inside a tomb, something's wrong. I'm seeing a lot of people in the faith that look good on the outside. I would nowhere near have them in charge of what I love and what is dear to me. Not even close. And I don't care how much they know or think they know and how good they look. You're not coming near what I love. And I will not trust you with what I love. Are we overcoming? Are we truly? Or are we just learning how to tick our boxes? Because one of the things we said today or the scriptures said that we're quoting, the joy is an outcome of overcoming. Ya Yaakov literally said it, count it all joy. Why? Because your overcoming will bring steadfastness, steadfastness in the perfection of your faith. You know, think about this. If we learn to honor him, honor each other, not be whitewashed tombs, actually experience overcoming as a result, the sanctifying of the nefesh, and the faith is now not all about us and our little religious movements and dogmas and brands and denominations and whatever else it is. And it starts becoming truly about him. I wonder if those are the things that would steal his joy. I'm, you know, Michael and I are going to suggest to you that the exact opposite of, you know, to, to truly have these things under control, how could we steal his joy? How could any child or spouse or brother or sister in Messiah, if they were all doing this, how could we steal each other's joy? We're going to talk about that in the coming parts of this series. So is joy in him really based on our happiness in the moment? We finish here for a time such as this. If we continue to make our faith based and be emotionally based, which many of the denominations and movements on both sides of the river have, I'm not sure they're going to be able to be used as a witness in the days ahead. And we all must consider this now very seriously on a prophetic basis. Are we in steadfastness and can we be used? Because there's stuff coming that Michael and I believe is not going to bring happiness to a lot of us you know we call today's teaching joy in him and if our faith is emotionally based if our if our joy is based on the pursuit of happiness this means that we actually can't have joy in him which and this is serious because this implies that there's a vast portion of the religious body on both sides of the river right now that claim to love him, that claim to have joy in him, and actually self is still on the throne. If you're pursuing happiness, you're, you've got happiness in yourself, not joy in him. And th this is what the enemy has done is like, Yah wants us to have joy in him. Well, the counterfeit to that is happiness in us, in our denomination, in our traditions, in what we do. Or, or do you get the flip side, yourself condemning yourself because you didn't tick whatever box according to someone's level of righteousness? All of both sides actually steal our joy in him. And the question is, if it's stealing our joy in him, is it stealing his joy as well? Because we're going to, as we progress through this, we're going to look, a covenant marriage is two ways. It's a reciprocal thing. Are we going to have joy in him? And is he going to have joy in us as a result? So for a time such as this, let us not mistake our happiness or lack of thereof as being in relationship to the steadfastness of our faith and therefore ultimately our joy in him. And so next week, we're going to look at another very important, important component of this and how it all relates uh, as we as we march towards the end of the age.
So for a time such as this, may we not steal his joy and may we actually truly obtain joy in him. That's not emotionally based on how we feel. Let's finish there and we'll come back shortly for a Q&A.